Okay, so this is 2.7, it's into the chapter, and we're focused on what's called an inverse function. You just have to understand that when we talk about inverse functions, we're talking about reverse operations. So a really simple example would be 5x and x over 5. And, and if we do a composition of f with g inside and g with f inside, we're going to notice something really interesting happen. So to start with function f, like we talked about last time, we're going to take the equation f, but put parentheses where we have x. And in it, we're going to put g of x. g of x is going to drop right in there. So x over 5. Well, 5 times x is 5x over 5. Those 5's cancel, and I just get x. OK, that's great. So this multiplying by 5 undoes the division of 5. If we do it in reverse, it's something over 5. This is function g. Okay, It says x over 5, so something over 5. But in it, I'm going to put function f. So I'll put a 5x right here. And 5x over 5, like we just talked about, is x. Now notice, both cases, we wound up with just x. Because one function undid the work of the other function. Multiplying by 5 and dividing by 5 undid one another. If the result is x both times, then the functions are inverses. Something really interesting happens with the ordered pairs. This is just something worth noting. If you look at the x's and y's uh, for these two functions, let's say that I put 1, 2, and 3 in. If I put 1 in, I get 5. If I put 2 in, I get 10. If I put 3 in, I get 15. Interestingly enough, if I put 5 in, 5 over 5 is 1. If I put 10 in, 10 over 5 is 2. If I put 15 in, 15 over 5 is 3. And so we can see that when you have a function and its inverse, the ordered pairs are swapping the x and y. And that's important for us to understand the first step of finding uh, an inverse. Now there are functions that uh, they just don't work to produce inverses. Okay, uh, some functions don't have an inverse, and so because of that, we'll, we'll look for those things. All right. So to find the inverse, this is important. If there's an f of x, put y, and then you know over here we said that the x's and y's trade places. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. Switch x and y places in the original equation. Then all we have to do is solve for y. If you get a single solution, great. If you end up with a plus or minus in front of a square root, uh, because you had to take a square root to solve for y, that's going to tell you you no longer have a function, which means we're not going to worry about its inverse. Its inverse wouldn't be a function, and so we don't want to keep that anyway. So the formal definition is that if f of g of x equals x and g of f of x equals x, then they're inverses. We're going to use f with a negative 1 exponent to represent the function's inverse. So there might be f of x. Okay, Its inverse would be written as f to the negative 1 of x. So these guys would be inverses of one another. Um, so we're going to see that in our notation at the end. That's really all that that matters for. So we're going to start by trying to find the inverse. First thing I'm going to do is make that a y. And then I'm going to trade x and y places. That makes this x equals y cubed plus 1. And now my job is to get y alone. Easily enough, I'm going to minus 1. x minus 1 equals y cubed. Interesting, you can kind of see the x plus 1 here. And the inverse of addition of 1 would be minus 1. The issue is kind of the steps. Now how do you get rid of a third power? Well, if you take a cube root, a cube root should undo a cube. And so now y is alone. Now you might say, Mr. Welch, do I need a plus or minus here? If this is an even exponent that we're getting rid of, I'd say yes, we need the plus or minus. With it being odd, I don't. So this is OK. So we would say that the inverse function of f is equal to the cube root of x minus 1. We found the inverse function. Perfect. Down here, same idea. We're going to make this a y, and then we'll write it as x equals y squared. To get y alone, all I have to do is take a square root. 
A square root, though, is an even power, so I have to put plus or minus. So y is going to equal plus or minus the square root of x. Because of the plus or minus giving me more than one solution, I reject this and say it has no inverse. Okay. All right. The last thing we're going to look at is can you predict ahead of time if a function is going to have an inverse or not? Well, if you remember the vertical line test, okay, remember we had these kind of things and we said, hey, look, vertical line doesn't ever touch the curve more than once. So it's a function. But when we switch to the inverse, we're going to trade x and y. So it's like we're taking this graph and we're going to turn it on its side. If I turned it on its side, it would fail. Well, I don't want to have to flip every graph over. So if you want to know if, an, if a function has an inverse, rather than run a vertical line test, you would run a horizontal line test. And if it crosses more than once, we would say that there is no inverse. And so if you look at this first curve right here, this red line, a horizontal blue line, anywhere I draw it, Okay, anywhere that I would go and draw that blue line, make it blue, I would have it only touch the red curve one time, which means it's got to be a function, or a function would exist as an inverse. But when I look at this, there's lots of places where my horizontal line touches more than once. And in any of these cases, if it occurs just one time, I have a problem. Because now the function, the original function does exist, but its inverse will not, because its inverse is going to have a non-function nature to it. And so that's how we can distinguish between function and non-function with the inverse, uh, or whether an inverse would exist. All right, well, that's it. Uh, good luck, and we'll see you in class.